Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much because you've done great things for us and there is yet more to come. As we sit now to listen to what you have to tell us today, we pray that you calm our hearts, open our ears, open our hearts, that we may be able to listen to your word. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I was given a tall order by the chaplain to introduce my husband. Um, many years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was in my second year at Makere University, and I was in the choir singing with joint airs. We had a concert, and I saw a gentleman, young man, <laughs> taking lots of pictures. <laughs> and I said, who is that one? You know, he was taking a lot of pictures. And after that, the story is long. <laughs> So right after I graduated, and he also finished his PhD in Australia, because he had just come for two months that time, we got married, and we've been married now for 32 years. We thank God for that. Reverend Canon Dr. John Senyonyi, can you please stand for recognition? <laughs> Yes, we praise the Lord. So we want to um, turn to our passage. So can you turn to Mark chapter 5? Mark chapter 5, verse 21. There are a few things I want you to look out for um, as we run through it very quickly. I know it was read to us. But as I read it again, I want you to watch out. There was a great crowd. And I want you to see the disease that this lady had. And how Jesus actually reached out to her. Verse 21. I'll read a few verses. I might not read all of them. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side. Jesus had been on Another side, he had been doing some other things. This time, a great crowd gathered about him. Jairus came and fell at his feet and said, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. Then a great crowd followed him, followed him and followed Jairus and thronged about him. And then we notice that there is a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And she said she had heard reports about Jesus. So she came up from behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Immediately the flow of the blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Verse 30, Jesus asked, who touched my garments? Who touched me? And the woman came in fear, fell down before him, and told him the whole story. So, I want us to focus on a few things here to see what kind of things were going on at the moment. And the first part is on the report there were reports that she had heard about Jesus. There were reports about what Jesus was doing in the region. And just before we come to this passage, Jesus had just demonstrated his power. First of all, over the forces of nature, 
by calming the storm. There was a storm and he just said, be still. And the storm and the waves heard him and they stopped. Now that would go round and say, what kind of man is this who even calms the winds and the waves? Then he demonstrated his power over evil by casting out the demons from this man and chasing them into the pigs that were nearby. This Jesus was different. The reports that were coming through were different. And it, it reminded me of what goes on in our country. And Besije came to mind. What reports do you have about Besije? For me, I know everywhere he goes, he leaves chaos. That is the report I have about him. We don't work. The, the roads are closed. They've stolen things from workers. Do you, do you see that kind of thing? Sorry to use that example, but that's what came to mind. All right? What reports were going on about him at that particular time? Jesus was different. And at that point, people pleaded with him to leave their region. That is in chapter 5, verse 17. Please go. Go to the other side of the river because we are afraid of the power that you have. We don't know what else you are going to destroy. You know, a whole herd of pigs had gone into the river. That is serious. And they said, we don't want you. It was hard to control you. And, you know, we are going to lose a lot of things. So Jesus left. And there we might learn a few things. If we tell Jesus to leave, actually he goes. Do you know that? says, Lord, I don't want you in my... There are people who, who vow and say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. He lives. He goes. So he left and went on the other side where other people welcomed him. And guess what? The crowd that was on the other side of the river, now the reports came to this other side of the river. So you find that another crowd now, a great crowd, crowd followed him and thro thronged about him. That's verse 24. The crowd. It went around him. And the man also who had been possessed, remember the other side of the river, began to bear testimony about what Jesus had done. Because he wanted to go with him in the boat. Said, no, 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 you stay here and tell others about what has happened. So he crossed to the other side. And he met a synagogue leader somebody who was in charge of the synagogue. And he said, Lord, I need you to come and help my child. You can imagine a leader, and, and we kind of imagined someone like the chaplain coming to fall in front of the crowd and saying, Lord, please come and heal my child. It's, it's, it's unbecoming of someone dressed like that to come and fall down in front of someone's feet in a big, big crowd. But what he was asking is, my child is sick. My child is dying. I need you to help. That kind of thing is not shameful. We go around saying, please pray for my child. My child is sick. My child is in hospital. My grandson is now in, sick. We have been asking you to pray for him. You know, So it's nothing to be ashamed about. So the great crowd, here we saw we have the reports and we have the great crowd. Then we have what I called the shame disease. This is a nameless woman. No name is given of her. Very ill. She had a flow of blood for 12 years. I'm glad this is the women leading. You know that kind of thing. Hmm. You cannot have it for 12 years. Non-stop. There are some people, friends of ours, who used to have their periods for seven days. And it was hard. Seven days, sometimes they don't even go to classes because they are very sick. This condition was called a hemorrhage, a condition in which a person bleeds too much and cannot stop the flow of blood. Some people call it the uterine disorder. In verse 26, she had suffered much, many things, from many physicians. So you can think of her suffering. She suffered, first of all, because of the disease, but also because of the physicians. Uh, we went to Mulago with, with my little grandson to do an echo. 
And my dear, I don't know if some of you, I, I said, thank you, Lord, for the places where we work. Because they send us to good places. We don't have to line up and line up and line up. I went there um, to the Heart Institute. There's a big tent there. And people had already arrived. They arrived by six. And sit there. And you, are not, you go in line according to how you came in. Many people. Hmm? And the office where we were going, that there's a doctor here, there's a doctor there, there's a doctor here. This one is writing the report. You know, it's a little space. And there you are trying to explain your problems. There's another doctor there. There's another doctor there. And the person writing the report is there. Now you can imagine what this woman is going through. You think of her in Mulago. Because she was that kind of woman. She was a poor lady. Didn't have much. Probably sitting in line. In that, I don't know where she would be in Mulago. What <laughs> uterine disorder. Maybe fistula. So it's, maybe the, the doctor would come. Most likely a man. In those days, I don't think they had women doctors. Right? So most likely a man. So say you, nameless woman, what is your problem? <laughs> Can you imagine trying to scream out to the physician what your problem is? You know, you see, it started, what, what started? You know that thing, that thing. You are not even saying what it is. What is it? You know the blood, where is it? <laughs> Do I even have to say where it is? Do you see, it's like the whole thing around her disease was shame, shame, shame. I can't stop the blood. I have a uterine disorder. Probably I'm smelling. And probably they don't, they don't even have the pads we have now. You've had Stella Nyanzi running around telling people that they should be buying sanitary pads. She's, she's saying the right thing, but probably the wrong body is saying the right thing. You know? Yeah, but you see, there are children who can't go into classes because they can't control that flow. They don't have anything to control it. So I'm just thinking, she just became worse. Every doctor who looked at her could not help her. Luke tells us that all the physicians had failed. And instead, her condition had got worse. They had all failed. They had made her condition worse. In verse 26, it goes on to say that she spent all her living Poverty had set in. You know, just think. They've told us that we need 75 million to take this little boy for an operation. 75 million. Where is 75 million going to come from? We are in Mulago tent. Look at the people who are there. Where do you get 75 million? You are not going to get it. Even 2,000. Because there's a lady who was, and I was watching, and I said, this is pathetic. There's a lady who goes by selling chapati and cake and soda. And there are some people who are hungry, but they cannot even afford a soda and a cake. In that Mulago place. So many times, turn around and just say, Lord, thank you for you, see you. Huh? You have a clinic here. Sometimes we sit for a few hours and we're like, ah, where are we sitting for? <laughs> hey, you go to Mulago and see. You go to Mulago. You sit for hours and hours. We got there at nine. Luckily, we knew someone and got out at two. We knew someone. Remember, we got out at two. Hey, hey, hey. So thank God. This woman had spent all her living. Poverty had set in. Then, imagine her unceasing menstrual cycle. Twelve years. And in those days, it was impure. You are impure. You are not supposed to touch anybody else. You are not supposed to live with anybody else. You are separated. So she was unclean. So wherever she went, she was not supposed to touch anyone. That's why it's such a big thing that she was able to touch. How did she even get through the crowd? To be able to get to Jesus. Remember the crowd that I told you about? They, was, they were big and they were thronging. They were many. 
These days, you know, I used to love going to see what was happening. These days, I don't because you might get stuck there. But I, I used to stop even when I was driving a car. What has happened? Yeah? Why, why is everyone looking? <laughs> we have that problem that we write, want to see. And so she, she probably, everyone was trying to see Jesus and she managed to kind of run through the crowd and went in and was able to touch Jesus. But she was not supposed to touch anybody. She was supposed to be a leper. She was supposed to have the word written ritually unclean all around her. I want you to think of the shame diseases that we have in our context. I am a counselor by profession. I have been doing counseling since time immemorial. Long time. Long, long time. And I keep saying, yes, I'm one of the first professionals in this country to do counseling. And I say, thank you, Lord, because in my office, there are shame stories. There are shame diseases that I have listened to that no one has ever told anyone else. They come to your office and say, Ruth, I have never, I am 30 years old. I've never told anyone this. Shameful. No one wants to know. You can't go to the crowd and stand here and say, you know, you see, I wear hey, hey. How? You can't stand there. They are shame things. The biggest one is HIV AIDS. I have HIV. You don't go around saying, I have HIV. You don't. And I remember Phil Tai. I don't know if some of you remember. He was the first person to come out and tell people that, you know, I'm HIV positive. And he sang a song, Today It's Me. Remember that one? Tomorrow, someone else. It's me and you in God. That one. <laughs> and he came out and said, You know, people, I am HIV positive. And he was like, What? Huh? Hey? Hey? Some people were not sure. I work in a bank, I work with HIV people that I work with. But no one is willing. We do World AIDS Day every year. No one in my bank there it comes out to say that, You know what? I'm positive. No one. We bring others from Tasso, from where, and say, me, I'm here. But I know they're there because I deal with them in my office. But I don't meet them in the lift and say, how is your HIV? <laughs> <laughs> and you know the problem with HIV, in fact, one time, one of, the, one of the students actually told me, Mrs. Senyu, can you help us? The preachers stand here and talk about HIV and make us feel like all of us did something wrong. Do they realize that sometimes we get HIV from our parents? So that one, I came and told them, I told chaplains, it was a long time ago, I don't even know whether Rebecca was the chaplain. You know, people would come here and say, yeah, you get HIV. Imagine it. Now, how do I come out when I have HIV, when I know that I got HIV from my mother? The research that I did for my PhD was to do with children who were born with HIV, who are now teenagers. And I had so many of them. My sample was 181. And I can tell you, even when they got it from their mother, it's still a shame disease. They go to school, S1, they have to take their medicine. So their friend says, what, what is this medicine that you are taking? So first of all, they change the bottle, the name. They put in another bottle, aspirin or panado or something. Eh, for you, you take panado every day. Yeah, I'm I have something that they told me. I don't even know what it is. You can't say and some of them stop taking medicine because it's a shame thing. They start calling you. There's a young man, because I did group counseling with them, and there's a young man who said, you know, they call us the dead, the, the walking dead. So there you are, and the children say, walking dead, walking dead. I mean, who likes that? Nobody. It's a shame thing. STDs, you get an STD. What does that imply? You are playing around somewhere with someone who likes to go and stand in line in the, in the STD clinic. Huh. Huh? You, you know, you don't do that. I've been recently dealing with children who have been sent away from school because of lesbianism. 
the headmistress calls you to the office and says, we, we caught you. We caught you. So you are going home. So you start imagining, how are they going to tell my parents? What are they going to say? So they call your mother. Oh. <laughs> eh? Mothers, you just imagine. They are calling you from school. They say, your child has a problem. Can you please come? And you think, now, what problem is it going to be? So they sit you in the office and say, hmm, we caught her in someone's bed. This is a girl's school. So go back with her. So you get home and say, now, my dear. Sometimes, some parents don't even talk. They stop. They don't know what to say. What do you say? That's a shame thing. So you ask the, the child, yes, what happened? I also don't know what happened. You don't know. I don't know. But here I am. And she's looking down. She can't look up to me to tell me what the problem is. There are issues like rape and defilement. I've also worked in a rape and defilement center for, for some years. And they would come. And the person would not look at me. Remember even the person who has raped her. Probably she doesn't even know. Or the person that has raped her or defiled her is her grandfather. Or her father. Now how do you tell anybody that? How do you turn around and say to your mother that your husband, my father, has done this to me? And the things I'm telling you are not just myths. They are things that I've seen in my counseling room. And I tell you, before I get into any office, I ask my husband, let's go into that office and pray. Because people are going to come here. And I want them to find healing. Because this is a time for opening up and saying all those things that you've never told anyone, ever in your life. Because that's the first thing that they say. You know, madam, I've never told this to anyone. Said, yes, I'm the first one and it's okay. I don't know where to start. It's okay. You can start anywhere. Middle, back, behind, front, what? Eh. Anywhere. Just jump in. I will rise. With, I will come in with you. And the tears start falling. I, 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 but you see, I'm, I said, it's okay. I have tissue here. It's for tears, for that shame, shame. And if you've gone through it, my dear, it is not an easy thing. Pornography, there are fathers and husbands who are caught in the act. You know, these days computers, you know, you open on your phone and there you are. The, the wife comes slowly behind you and is like, <laughs> you, man, what a... I tell you, a reverend. Oh, man. <laughs> Whoa. You know, it makes the mix worse. You know? <laughs> abortion. You know, I stand here many times and they give me the platform to talk about abortion. No one ever tells anybody that I had an abortion. I can assure you. You even get into marriage and you keep that as a secret. Then when you start wanting to have children, you're like, maybe. <laughs> oh, oh, eh, oh. Then you run to the counselor. You know, maybe. Ma you start talking. Hmm. Shame issues. Sex before marriage. You get pregnant. And you are here, you are a student. Maybe you are an usher. Maybe you are a reverend. Maybe you are, I don't know. You've led the service before. Maybe you are in the choir. And all of a sudden you realize that, guess what? Huh? The periods didn't come. Huh? Let me go. These days you can even buy your own pregnancy test. Let me see. Boop! Hey, it is positive. Oh, whoa. Now you imagine the nine months how you are going to actually carry that baby. You may be a bishop's daughter. You may be a reverend's daughter. You may be a vice chancellor's daughter. You may, I'm telling you, it becomes a mess. A shame story. Shame diseases. Shame issues. 
You may be driving. You know, I watch Agatari Kung Fu. And they stop people who are drunk. Have you seen those ones? They stop you when you are drunk. When especially like yesterday night, we found some few people that were being stopped by the police. And we said, that must be drunk driving. So they put you in there. What is it? Kaunya? Kaunya. So they put you on that thing. You breathe in and whoo, the thing goes up. And yes, you are drinking. Yes, you are a member of UCU. Then they put you on Gatari Kung Fu Ufu. They're like, please, please, don't show me. Don't show me. The vice chancellor will see me. And then, whoa, I'll lose my job. And then they put you in prison. Guess when they put you in prison yesterday, which was a what? A, a Saturday. You don't come out until Tuesday morning <laughs> because Monday is a public holiday. And you can't keep quiet. You know, some people say, let me go there and don't tell anybody that I'm in Pratt. I'm in the prison cell. But hey, you, you know, you get hungry. You don't have money. Everyone is asking for this. So you call your wife. <laughs> I am actually, where? <laughs> Set up prison. So he comes and gets you and says, what is it? What, why did they get you? Now, what do you say? I was drinking alcohol. You are a reverend, make mix worse. You are a bishop, Bishop Joel, you know. <laughs> so there we are, the shame story. She was in a shame problem. Sometimes, you know, I, I love to see these clients that I deal with coming out of the shame. You know, I love to see that because basically all I can do is talk to them and then pray for them and then meet again and again and again because now this child who was caught in adultery or this child who was caught in lesbianism or this, you know, the whole school has got to know. And sometimes it is the same community that I'm going back to. So you imagine me, will I be able to ever put my eyes up, ever, because of my shame? I don't want to look at anyone because of what I've gone through. I've been suspended for three weeks, but I have to come back. Or I've been expelled from the school, I have to go to another school. What reason am I going to give that I went to that other school? I have to get a letter from the school where I was so that I can be given a place in this other school. It is shameful. So I'm going from doctor to doctor with my letter saying, look, I am bleeding for 12 years, but the disease is not going. Go to another doctor. I am bleeding. Bring a two million. I don't have it. Go home. Look for the two million. You can't bring it. And now we still can't do anything about it. I'm, I don't want to say anything about it anymore. So now we go to the step that she took to reach out to Jesus. Remember the reports she had? This guy steals the water. This guy sends away evil. This guy heals. Right now, as we are traveling in the crowd, she is actually going to heal Jairus' daughter, who is very sick. Maybe. He can also deal with me. But Jairus can tell him that my child is sick. It is not a shame story. But me, I can't go in the crowd and tell him I am bleeding for 12 years. I'm not even allowed. I'm not even going to be given that opportunity because I am a leper. But let me try. Jesus turns no one away. I've heard that report. Maybe he could help. Maybe I can touch him. He says he turns no one away. No woman, no man. In fact, he was a friend of women. Maybe I should try. But I'm ritually unclean. Maybe he'll heal me. Let me just touch his clothes. Touch just his clothes. So she decided to touch the garment. That is verse 28. If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. She was so desperate that she was willing to try. 
a step of faith. I don't know what I'm going to, what's going to happen. Is it going to be healing? Is it going to continue? I have no idea. But I've had reports. And I'm going to believe them. And I'm going to try. I don't know what your shame story is. And probably you've talked to no one. You can't even venture. There are people who don't even want to talk to me because they know I'm the vice chancellor's wife. Supposing I tell him by mistake. Then maybe. Huh? Because there are some people who are running around with other people's wives. And yet they are members of staff. And you think, okay, so what will happen to that one? Shame. But Jesus says, you know, I am here. And this is what he did. She came up. Remember, she's coming from behind. She can't come from in front because they'll see her. So while people are trying to see what the problem is, she manages to go through and touches him. And what was Jesus' response? Jesus, there are three things here. Jesus stopped. Jesus turned around. And he looked around to see who had done this thing. He stopped. Remember, he was walking. Going where? To Jairus' home. Jairus is an important person. They were going that way. But he stopped. He could have said, this woman, she knows. This woman, she has no money. She's nothing. She's a leper. Let me first deal with Jairus' story. But Jesus did what? The same thing happened to Bartimaeus. He said, no, Lord, Lord. He stopped and said, who is that calling me? Bring him here. Jesus stops for your problem, your shame problem. He stops and turns around and takes time to say, what is it? What is it? Yes, you can clap. He stops. He does. He does. He stopped, he looked and said, who touched me? And you know, for me, it was puzzling. I said, why would Jesus say that? Doesn't he know that somebody had touched him and that all the power had gone out of him and that he had healed someone? He knew. So I'm thinking now, this is another step of faith. Who had touched me? Why did he ask? Wasn't he God? So now we come to the part where you come out with your testimony, with your confession, and are able to stand here and say, you know, you people, I was like this, but Jesus touched me. He stopped, he looked, and he touched me, and he changed me. I'm a different person. <laughs> we needed that testimony. I don't know if you've heard people talking about their lives. That Jesus has touched. Jesus has touched them and their lives have changed. I remember, I think it was Canon Bado Choir. Canon Bado Choir and I think Mr. Kabaza. They, was it Mr. Kabaza? They were drunk when they got saved. Totally drunk. Eh? And so you hear them, me, I was a drunkard. I would be on the street and I'm thinking, why would anybody say that? Mujimbi. Why would anybody say that? In fact, Bishop Bujimbi, his children were my age and we were friends. So one time <laughs> the, the daughter said, but daddy, uh, you know, talks about those things. They are shameful. They, you know, this is where he was. Yeah, we know where he was. You know how people say, me, I used to love women, you know. <laughs> That's shameful. You don't want anybody to know. But how does anybody stand up and say that, you know, me, I was a drunkard, me, I was this, I was that, I was that. Those shameful stories, they become testimonies of what God has done. The blood has stopped immediately. Now I feel the blood has stopped. I am well. My body is well. And she said she was still fearing. Maybe people will not allow me. Jesus has stopped. She has asked. And in fear and trembling, she knew what had happened to her. She fell down before him and told the truth. And the glory went to God. 
I said, woman, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Her shame now had turned into a testimony for the glory of God. Imagine if she had just walked away, touched, got healed, and turned away and disappeared. That would never have been written. So I'm encouraging you. What is it? Maybe it's your sinful past. When we are talking to people who are getting married, we, talk, we tell them, talk about your sinful past. Where the Lord found you and where you are now. And that wife of yours that you are taking will decide whether they want to go with you. Don't let it come out 10 years down the road. You know we travel. So maybe we are in the U.S. And we meet um, uh, someone that I went to school with and says, Hey, Ruth, hey, how are you? We are fine. This is my husband. Oh, your husband. How is the little baby that you had in S2? <laughs> And you didn't tell him. And you see the thing is coming out 10 years down the road. And, you are, and he's looking at you. The baby you had in S2. How come you've never told me? Be, it becomes even worse. But if I'm before marriage, I tell him, you know what? I have a little baby. Mm, that's my shame first. Are you willing to still go with me? It's like a confession. It's like God will give you that... Um, grace to be able to talk about things that happened to you because you've overcome them. Imagine I'm going back to the school where I, I, I was sent away. I'm able to tell that the people there, you know what, when I went to the counseling and everything, I, I, I confessed my sins. I'm now a new person. The Lord has healed me. You will not see that happen to me again. The kids will keep quiet. They will not talk about you again. You'll be able to go back into society. You know, people are made to stand in church and say, you know, I'm a, I was a pastor and this is what we did. I see it happening in some churches. I don't know whether we can, we do it here. But in some of the churches, they stand up and say, you know, we got married and I was expecting. So we've come to here in the church to apologize, to confess our sins. Please forgive us. Now they are taken back into the society and the glory is given to God. <clears throat> So, what are the lessons that we learn? Shame diseases that I've mentioned, abortion, pornography, adultery, all those. They place you in an isolated and unclean situation. You become isolated. It's a secret. Your little secret that you don't want anybody to know. But Jesus stops and looks out for us when we reach out to him in desperation and in faith. We know that he will help us because of the reports that we know about him. We know that he will help us. So never lose focus about what Jesus can do. The record is very clear. He will respond. Don't stop crying to him. Then we shall have a testimony on our lips about what God has done for us. And all the glory will be given to him. And that's why our theme was from shame to glory. Are you in a shameful situation right now? I know there are some of you here. And we are not going to ask you to do anything. We are just going to ask you to just reach out your hand. Because Jesus' record is very clear. He heals. He takes away the shame. He stops things that you never thought would stop. He heals those shameful things. Just reach out and say, Lord, I just want that shame to go away. And instead your name to be glorified. And you'll be amazed about what he can do. The song that the ladies sang says, I'm treading my sickness. I'm treading my sorrow. For the joy of the Lord. And there's a song. I didn't know any other song about this woman. But I knew it in Luganda. And it says. What? 
Tale lo mono ni cuchamba lo che a cumuzelero cuata nana nana ye a tu onye a cumuzengo saba that just says today touch his garment and he shall give you peace that's what it says are you ready to touch his garment? I'm going to ask uh, John to pray for us. Thank you. I'm sure we all have shame stories. So I'm going to ask all of us to stand up, please. All of us to stand up as we pray. As we place ourselves, whether we have confessed them before or whatever, it doesn't matter, but just to place everything before the Lord. Let's take a moment of silence. As we reflect on where the Lord met us, our shame stories, maybe we have kept some of them unsaid. Thinking that they are covered up, but within our hearts we know they keep on digging and bringing back guilt which Jesus has come to heal. Maybe something that you've hidden from your husband or from your wife. And what Jesus did was to bring out this lady because whatever is put in the light loses power over us. And even as Revelation says, they overcame him by, the te- by their word of testimony. Loving Father, we thank you for the word that we've just heard. It's your spirit who has been speaking to us. Lord, help each one of us to search and to understand that keeping anything secret does not heal our shame. But only when we put it before the cross, as Jesus himself called that woman to come out. And from that moment, she went away freed, liberated. We thank you because this is the grace that you show us again and again. And even today, Lord, we pray that you will help each one of us. And if there be people here whose hearts have not been freed, grant, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would touch them, would convict them, and would lead them to this Jesus who heals. We don't want any person to go away without receiving what you give. We want them to go away having a testimony, being able to say, this is what I was, but Jesus met me, this is who I am. For that becomes part of the gospel that we proclaim. So help each one of us, Lord. We want to thank you for Ruth and for the word that she has brought, that you've used her. Lord, take us from here assured of your presence. We thank you and we praise you in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.